participation and engagement which people are showing in this course. So uh, once again, I welcome you all uh, to the fourth session of this advanced course on uh, uh, practicing law. Uh, I have with uh, me, uh, Professor Margaret, and I also uh, thanks Professor Yenese uh, for uh, being uh, present in the course. And uh, we are extremely thankful for his uh, valuable contribution and uh, uh, inputs uh, which he gives uh, during the course because it gives a wider perspective to the students and help them to have a comparative analysis of different skills and the concepts uh, which we are referring to during our uh, discussions and interaction with the students. And uh, this comparative analysis is actually broadening their understanding about the law and the skills which are being used in different uh, jurisdiction. So we are extremely thankful for Professor Yenese for uh, contributing and broadening the horizons of uh, thinking and imagining of the students because you know, big innovation starts with the imagination and any contribution which pushes the boundary of thinking of our uh, young students who are the future of our nations uh, tomorrow when they'll start uh, practicing law uh, after being skilled uh, through their law courses and this course too. So thank you uh, very much to everyone who is present uh, in this uh, class today. And uh, to talk about the agenda and the objective of today's session, as you all know from the schedule of the course, that uh, theme of today's discussion is uh, uh, legal writing. And the more appropriate way would be to call it skill for effective legal writing. In the previous session, uh, we learn how to do legal research. And we need to understand one thing that how good we are at research. It may can bring us better result only if we know how to write it, it effectively. Sometimes it has been seen that lawyers are so good, advocates are so good in their research, but when it comes to writing it down, writing systematically, writing in a way which is not vague, which is not ambiguous, which is effective, which actually addresses to the audience for whom it is written can really make the difference. So re legal research is important skill but legal writing, writing that legal research outcome is equally important. And in today's session, we will be learning some effective strategies for having a more uh, effective outcome when it comes to writing. So today, Professor Margaret will be taking you through uh, different strategies and different do's and don'ts for effective writing. Uh, it will be coupled with uh, interactive exercises, breakout exercises. I'll be discussing briefly uh, about the components of writing. And then we'll have exercises uh, to correspond to our discussion. Uh, so today, uh, Professor Margaret will be uh, taking you through most of the aspect of legal, uh, effective legal writing. So with this short introduction, I uh, request Professor Margaret to take the lead in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barty. It's a pleasure to be here and um, see you all. And I really appreciate those of you who can keep your camera on. It's wonderful to see you uh, come back. And it's uh, always wonderful to have all of you participate. Um, I'd like to start by sharing my screen. So I'll do that now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes? Yes? Yes, no, it came. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I have a, uh, a two part presentation here. I will start one, uh, the first part with um, uh, zooming out, I call it. So if you think of yourself um, as a drone, right, going up and looking at some of the big picture items, right, um, and in terms of writing, we will start there. Um, and then I will shift to zooming in and doing some more um, specific matters. Throughout the slide presentation, I want to interact with you. I want to ask you questions and I want to hear what you think and I will be asking you to apply some of the concepts. Um, so um, 
please continue to participate in the way that you have been. Um, one thing uh, I think I shared with you that um, I have taught legal research and writing for 20 years in different contexts. And um, one thing that I see in the US context is that students often struggle with procrastination. And I'm wondering if I could just see a show of hands. Does anybody, has anyone ever struggled with procrastination when it comes to writing? Okay, so it does happen in other contexts, not just in the US context, right? Okay, um, so um, I would just like to make a distinction for you, right? We're, we always start writing um, when we are assigned a project and our start of writing is what approach are we going to choose? So I think it's very normal um, based on my experience for not just students, but many writers to procrastinate a little bit, right? So one thing that we can think about is what is the difference between planning versus procrastination? So um, sometimes you may have a legitimate scheduling issue, right? Um, many uh, researchers of time management suggest if you can write something down in your diary for a specific time, there's a greater chance that you'll do it. So as a student, my um, uh, tendency was to say, I'll do it tomorrow, right? Or I'll do it after I finish all these other things, right? Um, and maybe that's not so helpful according to the current research. So these are some, some strategies that you can um, employ. You can decide what is your best time of day. Some people work best at night. Some people work first, best first thing in the morning. You can act and try to estimate the hours that it will take you, right? And um, <laughs> if you're working for an attorney, often the attorney can say, just spend three hours or just spend 10 hours. It's a question that you can ask your professor, at least in the US con context. Um, you can act by using your calendar and writing down when you will do the writing, right? Will you do it all in one afternoon? Will you do it on the weekend? Will you do it on the evening? But you will make it part of a plan. You can act, if it, if it suits you, to do just small things or to start small. Um, and you can also decide what is the easiest way to get started. I think it's important to acknowledge that we all have different writing styles. So um, I recently published a book on research and writing. It took me three years to write. And when I was working on this book, um, my style I discovered was to work in bursts. But many people would give me the advice, Margaret, you just have to write a little bit every day. And my husband especially liked telling me about Hemingway, who maybe you have heard of, famous American writer. Hemingway went into his special room every day and devoted the first five hours to writing. Okay, I'm not Hemingway. I'm not a talented author of fiction. And that also is not my working style. So one thing you can do is to kind of zoom out and say, how have I been effective writing in the past? Whether it's a simple email, a letter, or a paper for law school. And I was hoping that some of you could share um, what are your writing habits or writing strategies. Um, I think it would be helpful for students to, to uh, others, all students to hear um, from whoever is willing to share, how do you approach a writing task? And these are some questions to think about. Do you struggle with procrastination? Do you start quickly and then stop for a long time? Or do you start slowly? Do you do your assignment all at once? Do you do it a little at a time? Do you try to get help or feedback? Do you create deadlines for yourself? Um, do you reward yourself when you're finished? Um, can anyone share their experience writing? I think it would be helpful if they're willing, if you are willing. your process, right? And it can just be the process for one small item. 
a letter and email. Thank you, Aslihan. I see a hand. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I have been writing different legal analyses and reports, judgments, decisions, or observations, uh, things like that, as a practicing lawyer for many years. And as you said, I had uh, the difficulty to start. But uh, when I start, the first thing is, of course, uh, having a, a good plan for myself. Actually, first of all, I'm thinking the main aim. What, uh, uh, who am I writing and why am I writing? And uh, who is going to be my audience? Uh, accordingly, I should plan my writing style. This is the first step. Then I'm making an outline for myself because if I just start, I will be lost on the way. I should have a roadmap uh, to have a concrete uh, document which is going to be meaningful and which is going to be um, understood. It should be concise, but also it should be effective. Uh, like a bullet, uh, bullets, it should hit uh, the target that I'm aiming for. So this is my style, just uh, planning and then making an outline. Uh, that framework uh, will ease my way um, to express uh, the main uh, aim uh, of the document, actually. Yes, this, this is my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Aslihan, for sharing that. I think when I was a law student, I would have loved to hear from you. Um, I would have loved to hear um, what someone of your position and your caliber was struggling with. There was another um, hand up. I would love to hear from that other person. Um, I don't that see That was anything. mine, I think. Oh, Gulendam, thank you. Yes, go. can you go ahead? Well, uh, when I, I'm going to write something, I just, fir first thing I do is to create a structure. What am I going to write? If I'm writing a petition, the main, um, points that I want to touch, like the bullet, bullet points. I just write the um, headers, a few, like the general and most important headers. Then I, I actually, before even I do that, I just jump to the conclusion. I And I know what I'm going to write at the end of the petition. So that I know, I, I mean, if I know the place that I'm going to end up, it's easier to find the way in my belief. And uh, if I know my destination, I think I can like prepare and follow a road that is easier to go that direction. So I just, first of all, I just write the like conclusion part. Then I start the main like stop places that I wanna touch. And then at the end, I start filling the blanks and, and like writing under the depth, under that bullet, bullet points. But first thing is to create a structure and not just to make sure not to miss anything out, like forgetting to mention something. I just touch up, touch up some like most crucial parts of the petition. I, this is for the petition, but when I'm, let's say, writing for my studies for learning purposes, it's just a, like a long and um, careful process. So I try to take my time and like read and learn everything as much as possible. But when I have a deadline, when I need to finish something by some date, first thing is structure and to know where to end. Thank you, Gul and Dam. And thank you, Aslihan. You have both done a wonderful job of giving some pre-writing activities that can help people get started. Um, one thing I just wanna highlight um, on this slide um, there are two helpful resources that uh, many people and writers have used um, to discover what motivates them and to help them plan. Um, and so if you um, copy, uh, copy down these links, or if you just Google uh, Gretchen Rubin quiz, um, she will, it's a very short quiz and she will, and it, it, it is just a really fun little exercise and she has a um, uh, she explains kind of what motivates you, um, and that can be helpful to know about yourself. Um, and then uh, Michael Hyatt is a, a planner that I found helpful that helps you break, break down tasks. Um, but to get back to the pre-writing activities that both Aslihan and Gulandan mentioned, um, 
they both mentioned uh, a number of these things, right? They mentioned um, coming up with a schedule, um, uh, coming up with a plan, right? Coming up with a plan, uh, also coming up with bullet points, right? Maybe an outline, right? So you're not just starting from the beginning and writing in a linear fashion, right? You kind of have to often zoom out and have a plan with um, an outline or and or a work plan. How will you approach this? Um, if you're doing something factual, um, it, it's good to organize your facts. Um, I find it helpful to tell students have found it helpful um, to if they have maybe three different testimonies of facts and they have to tell one story, right? Then you can organize the facts in a chronology before the event, at the time of the event and after the event. Um, you can do that even with bullet points before you tell the story. So these are a pre-writing activity before you begin drafting. Um, having kind of a plan, sometimes I have a hard time starting. So sometimes I will just create a file on my desktop and put everything I need in that file and organize it. And then I will just start the document, right? And put in the necessary header. It depends on what I'm drafting. If it's a book chapter or a legal document, I do still practice as an attorney or if it's something for um, my students, the, the PowerPoint, right? I'll, I'll just start, I'll, I'll start small. Um, so these are some of the uh, strategies and both Aslahan and Gulendam mentioned them, right? Um, as well as these strategies, right? And one strategy that is used in, um, that is uh, discussed a lot in PhD circles in the US um, is the Pomodoro method. And if you were to Google Pomodoro in YouTube, you would find an explanation of this. And the idea is that um, you uh, create an atmosphere free of distraction, but you do it in a limited time. So you can do just one hour, right? There's different time limits suggested, but for one concept is just one hour. So you put the timer on for one hour, you completely clear all distractions. Um, you go in a place you know that you can work, whether it's a cafe or your room, and you work for one hour and then you take a break. So sometimes this is easier for people because otherwise you're thinking, I have to spend the whole afternoon. I don't want to spend the whole afternoon. I'd rather be outside, right? So the Pomodoro method helps you focus for just one hour. Um, and so when I was writing my book, I would try to get three hours done before noon. Um, and then I'd give myself a break between each hour. And in that way, I could make some progress over the week. Um, I think Aslahan mentioned um, internal deadlines, creating a chart or a task list, and of course, removing distractions, right? And so we have our phones, we have our browsers, we have our email. Um, and so trying to minimize that, to know yourself, right? It's much more fun for me to text a friend about what we're going to do this weekend than it is to sit down, right? But I have to minimize all those things to get some writing done. Um, okay, any questions or comments on strategies or strategies that have worked for you? Um, so these are just some things to get started, and I hope it helps you realize that many writers in many different contexts have trouble getting started and have trouble finishing. And so it's not um, something that you should feel badly about. It's just something you need to manage, right? You need to manage it and come up with different strategies. So where I like to start um, in terms of um, the actual drafting is a basic uh, rhetorical concept. It's taught in literature classes, um, but it's also taught in law schools, um, figuring out um, your audience, right? I like to start with the concepts of audience, who is your audience, and tone. What is the emotional implication or feeling, right, of the writing? So before we start drafting something, right, we have to decide who are we writing for. So if Aslahan is writing a book or Gulendam is writing for a professor, those are two different audiences, possibly, right? Um, so as a, young, as a young attorney or as an attorney, you could be writing for a client. You could be writing for your supervising attorney. You could be writing to submit something to the court or you could be writing to a colleague, 
opposing counsel, right? Co-counsel, um, some things to, so, so this is, is, these are the different audiences, right? So I, I didn't include, right, uh, like my audience when I when I wrote a textbook. So I wrote I wrote for I write for students a lot. That's another audience. That's a different audience. Um, common um, mistakes or things to think about in terms of the tone, um, at least in the U.S. context, if we're submitting something to the court, it's formal, and we would not use the word I. I think I believe um, we would not use that. Um, we would not use legalese. Um, can I show a hand? Can I see a show of hands? Do people know what I mean when I say legalese? No? Okay, thank you. Um, so when I say legalese, what I mean is um, draft, legal drafting that is a little bit old fashioned and antiquated, is very, has a lot of jargon right? Um, so a lot of undefined legal vocabulary um, and is hard to understand. So we will see some examples of that later on. So that might be an American colloquialism, legalese. So it's basically kind of antiquated, outdated, jargon-filled, obscure legal writing, right? So with undefined terms. Um, that's what I mean by legalese. We would never use emojis or text abbreviations in any kind of um, legal document, even an email to a colleague, um, we would be not be overly casual um, and we would be careful about repetition. So what I wanna um, raise for you as an audience, a possible audience, right, is the idea of a busy reader. So I imagine as law students, you feel busy, right? Um, some of my students told me several years ago that they don't necessarily want to read a long syllabus. They're too busy. So a syllabus is what we give our students at the beginning of class. Um, and I thought, you know, that's true. We all feel busy. And when we're writing in law, we're writing for the court um, or usually the court um, or perhaps a client, that person um, and a lot of the writing that we do in the law school or paralegal context, we're writing for a supervising attorney. So if we, if we use a supervising attorney as an example, that person maybe has 60 cases, maybe 120 cases, maybe they're supervising even more cases, maybe they're supervising a number of lawyers, right? That person is busy. If we think about the court as our audience, right? Um, the, 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 high, the high court or the mid-level appellate court um, that I worked for after law school um, and that um, I believe exists in both of our systems. Um, in the US context, in my state, they could have a thousand cases pending at any time. Um, and they're slowly writing decisions, right? Um, and, and making their way through the agenda. They're busy, right? So that's something to keep in mind that we wanna make their life easier. Right, um, and so we. That's that's what I want you to remember. The audience in law is often a busy reader, and we want to make their job easier. So I'd like to ask you some questions, um, and this is really about tone. These questions. So in the U.S. context, um, we want to think about. I'm just going to sl slip back here. Um, who we're writing for and the difference in tone between a client, a supervising attorney, a court, or a colleague. So we wanna think here, um, what is appropriate, right, for our audience? So we'll take, um, a, we'll just start a general discussion on things to think about. Um, and so the first question would be, what kind of language would you use with a client who is coming to a lawyer for the first time because she was in a car accident? For example, you had to write her um, a, a letter after your meeting telling her whether or not you were gonna take her case, okay? Um, what kind of language would you use with a client who's, very, you're her very first exposure to an attorney 
Sevki? I think we still don't use any legal term to. Yes. Thank you, Sevki. Right. You, you have to assume that this person does not understand legal terms. For example, um, a common legal term in the United States would be statute of limitations, which means how long you have to sue a case. You don't need to use that word to tell the client um, that uh, her deadline is coming up. You can simply say the deadline for bringing a case is in three years or six months or two months. So you don't need to use specific legal terms. This, this is with a client, right, who came in. So that goes, and, and you may need to explain the court process, and you may need to explain the term for beginning a lawsuit. What about a client? How would you explain, how would, how would you compare how you would speak with a first-time client with a single legal problem versus a business owner who maybe has retained counsel over 30 years? Would you have a different type of language that you could use with this client? And how, how would it be different? Yes, Stanton. Uh, so someone who has experienced, uh, you know, with a court, uh, who's, who has a counsel, I believe, so he is uh, experienced with the, the uh, court procedures. So we can use the legal terms and then uh, to explain the oral process, it would be easier, I believe. Yes, so exactly. That person may have more knowledge, may have more what we would call legal literacy. They may not understand all the nuances or definitions, mm -hmm. but you may be able to, um, they may understand the court process. Abhe, I think I saw your, your hand up. Would you like to contribute something? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what I was thinking that probably uh, since they have already employed the law firm for a very long time, so they would want somebody who would give them uh, whatever they want briefly, so that because we are looking at that people who are busy. So, just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Good. keeping that in mind. Good. Thank you for, for bringing us back to the busy reader. So they don't want a two-page letter, and yeah. they might be able to understand the point more quickly. Thank you, Abhay. Exactly right. Vishal? Vishal, I see your hand up. Would you like to contribute? Hello. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, for the uh, first, uh, the one client who is just a small, had a small time affair with some legal problems, for him or for her, we can be a more uh, sympathetic approach, empathetic approach. Like, yeah, understand this, and this is your uh, situation. We will get out of it. And for a multimillionaire, busy kind of client, we will be like, yeah, so this is the real situation. This is the real consequence which may happen. And we have to do some things like this. So being real and for the first one, being empathetic. Thank you, Vishal. I agree with you. And I like how in your example, the business owner was a multimillionaire. I wish all the business owners that I represented were multimillionaires. Um, I, I want to add just one thing, and that is in both cases, you would probably give the client um, the, the, all, all the possibilities, right? All the possible consequences. So you wouldn't necessarily restrict the information, but you, you, would, you could talk about it in a different way. Um, okay, so our next question, Oh, I see. Um, we have two more raised hands. Aslahan. Uh, thank you. Actually, um, apart from uh, our tone, uh, I would like to also add uh, when we are writing a letter, uh, we should first uh, start with, OK, what is the main of this letter after saying like, uh, hi, hello, etc. Have a nice day, blah, blah. We can um, think about what I, I would like to convey uh, to the person. And then in the end, what am I expecting from that person? Like bullet points, we should also, uh, it, it shouldn't be just like a letter uh, with bulk information, but uh, on a, on a row, it should go uh, step by step. What I am going to convey and then what am I expecting from that person? Uh, we should not forget about being uh, comprehensive and concise about that two points. Thank you. 
Thank you, Aslahan. That is a very good point. And um, we actually have an exercise in a little bit um, where I ask you to rewrite an email. Um, with that thought in mind, that um, we have also busy readers who are our clients. And sometimes um, if they're, they're feeling anxiety about getting a letter from an attorney, it's good to know the main, main idea. This would be true for a colleague in a court as well. So I like your point of starting off with the main idea and making sure that there's a specific request as well. Very good. Um, okay, let's do one more example. Um, I'd like you to compare the kind of language you would use if you're a member of the parliament um, or the legislative body, whatever the legislative body is called in your jurisdiction, and you are, are responsible, you are tasked, you are asked to write a new law on taxation versus a client who was a brand new business owner who had a legal tax question. Anyone would like to anyone like to give this a try? Can you imagine um, a tax law? I had to take tax and it was my least favorite subject. Um, okay, good. We see two hands. Asim Rituja. Uh, I'm sorry, I probably pronounced that wrong. So please correct me. Is Asim, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, it actually pronounced like awesome in English. Oh, awesome. thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think uh, you should use a, we should use a formal language. I think you should you, you are talking about legalese. And uh, we should use a legalese language when we are a part, member of the parliament. But if I am a client, I will use a, I don't know how to say, but I'll say public language. So I'll ask my questions in whatever I know because I don't know law. So like that. Thank you, awesome. Um, yes, and I would like to hear from, uh, uh, that's a very good point, and I'd like to hear from Rituja, and please tell me how to pronounce your name. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, Professor, you are right, it's Rituja. Oh. Thank you for giving me a chance, and uh, I think uh, in the capacity of a member of parliament, uh, I'm free to use uh, the legal jargons or the legislative jargons because the target audience is such that uh, who would understand uh, what I, like what my task is, and uh, I have to be effective in making the law, and also to avoid the pitfalls. Uh, I have to use that kind of language. Uh, yeah, and I think in, with respect to a new business owner, I have to be more simplified. Uh, he is definitely not in not in capacity to understand what the legal jargons are or wh what uh, uh, the terminologies are in a tax law. So I have to simplify it, make him understand what the intricacies are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rituja. Um, it was a pleasure to hear from both you and Awesome. And both of you are exactly right. There is a time for using technical, high-level um, jargon is, is kind of pejorative in, in English, but, but, but high-level technical legal words. If you are in um, uh, a, a, perhaps a, a legal job or if you're a member of a parliament, that, that may be the time, right, to use specific high-level legal words. Um, as we saw yesterday, um, or maybe it was two days ago, when we looked at a statute, um, the legislature may also have to define its terms, right? Um, but that doesn't mean it can't use high-level terms. Whereas with the client, even though both matters are on tax, um, you would define those terms. Um, one more quick question before we move on to the particulars. Um, and I was going to skip this, but I think it's relevant because um, a lot of you may be, become litigators and working for the court. Um, so what kind of language would you use if you're making an appellate argument to uh, a mid-level court, I think in India it would be called the high court, about evidence versus you're speaking to a client, um, a criminal defendant, someone charged with a crime, 
about an evidentiary issue such as the admissibility of the murder weapon. So how would you speak to the court versus the client? It's maybe not that much different, but I want you to understand what is permissible in speaking to the court. So can anyone speak to that aspect of how, what kind of language you would use in responding to a mid-level or top court? Uh, thank you, Ake. I think your mic might be off. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, ma'am, sorry for that. Ma'am, I'm just giving it a try as I have not, uh face the court yet so okay. i believe i believe that uh, before the court uh, we will always have to be like uh, have to have a tone where we are praying before the court so i mean we are humble we are requesting something however uh, in front of the defendant that criminal defendant or the person who is accused uh, we will be more explanatory we will be telling them that okay uh, this action has this consequence I believe. I mean. Thank you. That's very good, Abhe. So um, I understand that you may not have uh, offered any papers, documents to the court yet. I understand that. Um, so thank you for giving it a try. So you're right. The tone to the court is always very respectful. Um, the court likely knows the definition of many legal terms, right? Um, and so um, you may have to define the issues. Um, and you may, you may have to talk about differing legal terms, um, but um, if it's an elementary matter, um, yeah, I mean, you have to explain the issues, right? Just like we did IRAC, you, can, you still do IRAC for a court, um, but you can assume that you maybe don't have to start from the very beginning, right? And you may not have, maybe you don't have to repeat a lot, right? And you're absolutely right. Um, I think in most jurisdictions, you, you want to be very respectful. And for a client, again, um, same issue, right? Evidentiary, um, you um, would have to be more explanatory. So with the court, after you lay your framework, you can kind of then go on to talk about your legal reasoning and legal argument. With a client, you might have to go a little bit more, uh, if, if this kind of client, right? assuming the criminal defendant is not that experienced in court, um, you might have to go a little more slowly. Uh, yes, Sevgay. Uh, actually, I think the same, but uh, if we are making an argument to the court, we should use the um, legislation in that point, and we should explain this to the court. But if we are talking to our client, we should explain the reason why the law is uh, was created like that and uh, how we are going to use this in the case. So I think this is the difference. Oh, interesting. So I think what I heard you say, I lost the very beginning, is that with the client, you're explaining the intention behind the law, right? And maybe the basics. And with the court, you're assuming maybe the court knows that and you're going on into the complexities. Is that a yeah. fair summary? Okay, good. Yes, good. very good. Um, okay, good job, everybody. Oh, thank you, Dr. Um, Yenisi. Yes, I'd like to hear your contributions. Uh, no. We are talking about the perspective of the lawyer. Yes. And the lawyer, how they approach the client and how they address the court. But the other issue is the how the court makes a decision and how, how they formulate the decision. And this is a point we have been working for two years for Turkish judiciary. And there's a big project going on in Turkey in order that the judges, if they formulate the judgment or the decision, they should use a, a template. So they should use first the, a plain language. This is the most important thing that uh, uh, a citizen, a non-lawyer citizen who reads the decision understands what's going on. And if there's many legal expressions, an ordinary or citizen does not understand what's the inside of it, but there are some expressions, legal terms, you have to use them, you cannot avoid them, but at the end, uh, accused 
convicted person should understand why he was convicted and learn something about this. And also the audience, the other individuals in the community should also learn why this person has been convicted. So this uh, education for the community, the judgment of the judge. But this is a big problem. And in Turkey, the judges start a sentence with last two or three pages. They don't never put a comma, not the punctuation. And it's, it lasts three, four sentences, pages. This, this one sentence. And you, you cannot follow this sentence. So the first thing we are trying to teach the judges is to make a full stop, to give a, a short sentences and understandable sentences. And uh, so this is a big project we are now in progressing. But my concern is with this template. If there's a template and they fill out just the blanks, so this is not a good thing as well. But in order to make a, a systematically formed decision that they have a beginning and end and there's a content of it, they are trying to introduce a template. Uh, I don't know what you think about this template. So that's very fascinating to me. Um, and um, Dr. Yenesi, and thank you so much for telling me about this. It sounds like there are so many fascinating legal developments going on right now in Turkey. Um, I want to thank you for previewing some of the material that's coming next in terms of using short sentences, punctuation, paragraphs <laughs> to make things clear. Um, and I also want to thank you for pointing out that many times as lawyers, the safest way for us to write is so that a lay person understands us, regardless of our forum. Um, in terms of your question about using a template, um, I think that's tricky. Um, I see a pattern in many of the decisions that I read, whether they're for the mid-level state court or our US Supreme Court, and the pattern, it follows basically an IRAC, or an, almost an IRAC pattern. It starts with the facts first, then the issue, then um, the rule, then applies the rule, and then the conclusion. So I see a pattern in, in many of the decisions that I read. Sometimes what's missing is the specific um, application. They don't really understand. In a state court, the mid-level, they don't necessarily really explain how the rule applies to the facts. They just say the rule, and they just say, and here's the conclusion. Um, so I see what you're saying. The template has pros and cons. I don't know if Dr. Yadav has any thoughts on that. No, okay. Do you have any um, anything further, Dr. Yenesi? One more thing. The, we also want to introduce number of paragraphs. So from one to, to, to the end, it should, each paragraph should have a number in order to facilitate the citation. Mm -hmm. This is another development we have now. That's very interesting. Um, and I really like um, the idea that the, the person involved in the case should be able to understand the judgment and the decision. I don't know that we've achieved that or even discussed that in that manner um, in, in our US system. So that's a fascinating, um, that's a great goal and fascinating to me that you're, that you're working on that. Um, so moving on to some of the concepts that um, I have seen over the years as um, when we in the English language context and in the US concepts as basic um, best practices for legal writing, um, we will go through some specific strategies that I hope that you can start to recognize, think about and apply in your own um, legal writing. Um, so one concept is um, omitting surplus words. What does that mean? Well, well, first of all, why should you do it? So remember, we have a busy reader. If we have a lot of extra words in, in our writing and the words aren't necessary, that's taking up time. It's taking up, uh, it's making your point less clear. Um, so um, one strategy for omitting surplus words is to um, examine, right, 
the words that are in your sentence and how much they contribute to the meaning of your sentence. So every sentence will have words that are kind of like glue words, maybe the ands, the ors, the thes, and then sentences have words that cannot be omitted without changing. Um, so an example, and if you're interested in a resource, there's um, a very good book for students written by Richard Wittig. Um, you may be able to find some of the older editions online um, used and maybe even public access. Um, and he talks about uh, writing in plain English. Um, so, for, so for example, in, in omitting surplus words, right? Let's look at our, this sentence. A trial by jury was requested by the defendant. Okay, it's not, a, it's not a bad sentence, right? But if we look at all the words that are not necessary, we have an, an article, right? Ah, by, was, by the, those are a lot of glue words. The words that we can't omit, those are words that are underlined. Trial, jury, requested, defendant. We can't take those words out, otherwise we'd lose the meaning of the sentence. So another way of saying that same sentence with less words would be the defendant requested a jury trial. We will talk about the passive voice in a little while, but notice if you're familiar with passive voice and active voice that this is the first example is a passive voice and this is active voice, right? Active voice, all that means is that the subject comes first. The subject or the noun, um, the actor of the sentence comes first. That can often cut down on your words. We see here another example, right? The ruling of the trial judge um, was prejudicial error for the reason that it cut off cross-examination with respect to issues that were vital. Can you see all the blue words here? All the words in between. The words that are underlined are essential. The words in between, not so essential. So if you can rewrite that sentence, you can say the trial judge's ruling was prejudicial error because it cut off cross-examination on vital issues. So for example, if we look at the, uh, these examples, they can often, these phrases, right? They can often be replaced with one word. So I often tell my students, there's nothing wrong with the word because. We can always use that word. It's not a bad word, it's simple, it's to the point. We don't need to use for the reason that. Um, you can always use then, right? We don't need to use at this point in time. Um, there's nothing wrong with the word about. There's nothing wrong with the word before. There's nothing wrong with the word after. So you can keep, it, it doesn't, it's not too simple. It's rather, think of it as elegantly simple, right? Elegantly simple and to the point. So let's see if we can apply that, right? Um, another way of thinking about surplus words is sometimes it's also called compound constructions. Um, so both concepts just mean a lot of words for one concept. So I'm going to ask for some um, participation here. So if we say by means of, what would be one word that you could give me that would substitute for by means of, by the means of. Ramazan, don't go away. Keep your hand up. <laughs> we can use true. I'm sorry? We can use true instead of by means of. True, true. true. By means of, oh, through. Yes, thank you. Through, yes. Any other ideas? Good, we'll stick with that. Um, what about by reason of? Sevki? 
Um, because of? Yes, even just because lots of times, because. What about for the reason that? Maybe only for. Sorry, is that Gulandam? Oh, yes, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I That's okay, I just didn't quite hear you. Can you say it again? Only four. Only four, exactly, only four. In as much, so in as much is an example of legalese. You might find that in older court decisions. It's a little antiquated. We wouldn't say that in language. Um, so that would be an example. In as much as, maybe you don't know what in as much means. <laughs> No. Okay. So for this one, I'll take in as much as you could just simply say like, that would be more like saying like, um, in relation to, regard. Yeah, good. Regard. Is that um, Gulandam again or Stanzin? Stanzin. Thank you, Stanzin. Uh, and last but not least, in the event that. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you can speak. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I give up. Awesome. Uh, I was gonna say if, but I like that. I, I like if. Do you have another um idea, Stanzen? I'm not sure. I was thinking circumstances. Uh huh. It's a tricky one, and I'm also giving you these words without context. So um, here are some ideas, right? The important thing is not so much what the word is, but that you are thinking, wait a second, we don't need all those words. And there is one word we can use, right? So by means of, um, by or through, I think that's also correct. Uh, by reason of, because, actually I would take off this of, <laughs> um, for the reason that, because in as much as that would be since maybe also maybe because in relation to concerning regarding about the very simple word of about it's fine it's a fine word to use in writing it's direct and clear and in the event that i think awesome you mentioned this if you thought it would be if very good um so i we talked about active voice and passive voice can I just see a quick show of hands? Um, have people been, ex uh, if you have um, uh, learned about this concept, speak writing in the active voice versus writing in the passive voice, um, can you please raise your hand so I know if this is the first time that you're hearing about it? Okay, so I have a lot of people that are showing up on my screen, well, five people, um, at least have heard about it, but then many others have not raised their hand. So we have a mixed group, which is fine. That is completely fine. Um, so just like I said before, um, an active voice is when the subject or noun is doing the action, right? So um, in, in the, the sentence that we see here, John kicked the ball, who is doing the action? John is doing the action. That's a very simple sentence structure for the busy reader to follow. And it also propels your writing forward. So active voice is often, um, it's actually sometimes easier to write in and it can be easier to understand. So John kicked the ball, active voice. Passive voice, the ball was kicked by John. Can you see the difference? So the second example, we have, we don't start off with John, we start off with the, the direct object, right, ball. Um, so the, this is a little bit to the same point of omitting surplus words. You can keep your writing simple in this way without losing your meaning, your sophistication, right? The complexity of your legal argument. You can just make it easier to read. Any questions? Um, so I'm going to ask you to rewrite some sentences from the passive voice to the active voice. 
Um, so our first example is the seashell was found by the girl in the white hat. Would someone be willing to give this a try? Sanson, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the girl found seashell in the white hat. Uh, yes, I think we would say the girl in the white hat found the seashell, okay? Um, because the white hat modifies girl and not seashell. Uh, yes, yeah, Sepki, would you like to do the next one or do you have a comment? And the next one. Great. Uh, all enjoyed the movie. Right, everyone enjoyed the movie. Good. Uh, next sentence. Third sentence, the decorations for the party were created by Masood. Stanzen, is that another hand raise? Or did you mean, oh, you didn't mean to. Okay, Abhe, thank you. Ma'am, Masood created the decorations for the party. Masood created the direction, the, the decorations for the party. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Abhe. So it's simple, right? We're just putting the actor first. It's not that hard. Um, we can do that in our legal writing as well. Um, last but not least, this is a little bit trickier. Ape, would you like to give this one a try or did you just neglect to take your hand down? <laughs> Uh-oh, I lost him. <laughs> uh, uh, Subhankar? Ma'am, uh, there, there was a phone in the car. Yeah, so this is tricky because there's no subject. We're not given a subject, right? There's no name. Here, they, we have a girl, we have all, we have Masood. This last one, there's no subject. Um, so we could say someone left the phone in the car, right? Other, that's the only way we could change it to active is to insert the subject. Um, so thank you for that. Very good job. Um, I want to let you know, um, students often get excited about writing in the active voice, which is great. There are some times when the passive voice is fine. What if you're representing a criminal defendant and it's contested whether uh, who found the gun, right? You might want to say the gun was found, right? You might want to say that. Um, just like this example, you were trying to avoid naming the subject because the subject is unknown. Um, sometimes in an email on a touchy subject, if you don't want to be conf confrontational and you think people might have different opinions, you could say, here the example is, mistakes were made. Instead of, you made mistakes, right? So you're being a little indirect to, in order to be more polite and less conf confrontational. Um, if you're talking about generalities, every year, millions of people are entering the job market, um, that there's nothing really wrong with that. That's kind of a different context. Um, and lastly, for, for emphasis. So let's say you really want to emphasize that insulin was discovered. Instead of saying scientists discovered insulin, you say insulin was discovered, right? Notice that all these examples are not necessarily what you'd be talking about in a legal brief to the court, right? But I just wanna tell you, it's not poisonous, passive voice, right? There, there is an appropriate time. Um, okay, moving on, uh, choosing your words with care. We've talked about this a little bit. I think I mentioned legalese, so we'll continue to um, define that for you. Um, words, remember I said last time, in as much, right, is legalese, it's, a, it's considered um, an, an anachronistic, old fashioned, right, no longer necessary. Um, another example would be aforementioned. You can just say the plaintiff, right? Acronyms, so people wanna use acronyms because it saves you energy from typing out the whole thing. Um, however, what I would suggest and what legal writers suggest, um, even if I'm a judge and I've had many, uh, this is the name of my town, Buffalo, I've had many cases with the Buffalo Police Department. I don't think of them as BPD. I think of them as the police. BPD is, makes me think, what's BPD? 
And then I go to, oh yes, police, right? So instead of using an acronym, what I would suggest is that you shorten this, this long statement, right? So instead of saying Buffalo Police Department, just say police instead of using an acronym. Um, also, especially in legal writing, you don't... Sue Ponker, did you have a question or a comment? Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, okay, seems like maybe. Um, okay, so with adjectives, um, you can often avoid adjectives and just be specific and get your point across more clearly. And so when I have my students practice writing a cover letter to law firms, many times for some reason they have written, I have learned a myriad of skills in uh, you know, my legal writing class. Well, first of all, I'm not sure if five skills is really a myriad, right? I'm not sure, so sure that's precise. A myriad, I think it would take you maybe 20 years to learn a myriad of skills, okay? So that's one thing is that lack of precision. Second, what's better for the reader is to see what specific legal skills that student has, has learned. So if the student can say, I have learned legal research on Westlaw, drafting summons and complaint, and researching and writing legal memos, that's much more specific. That's much more informative, right? So be careful with adjectives. Um, this we'll talk a little a bit about with persuasion. Um, some of the things you wanna think about when you're writing legally is to be concrete, simple, visual, and specific, right? So um, this kind of shows you and returns to some of the concepts we've already introduced, concrete, you don't need to use what I would say is a colloquialism or a saying, passed away. The defendant or the decedent passed away. You can just say died, right? That's just kind of the same concept we were talking about. Died is not bad. Instead of saying in, for a vehicle accident, the cars collided with each other, you can just say they crashed into each other. Use the simple and the familiar. Visual, especially if you're telling a story about your client, you want the court to empathize and to visualize the characters in the story, especially your client. So um, instead of saying plaintiff, maybe you start off with the specifics, 47-year-old Hector Albert. Um, and then again, the specifics I mentioned, instead of saying a myriad of skills, talk about what specific skills you've you've um, learned. Um, and now we come to something that Dr. Genesee has previewed for us. Thank you very much, Dr. Genesee. Um, and it's about the readability of your sentences, right? So you don't have to try to prove how intelligent you are by making long, complicated sentences. And indeed, Dr. Genesee mentioned that courts will write a decision with a sentence that just goes on and on, if I understood him correctly, right? And that is so concerning to the Turkish bar that they're, they're working with the judiciary to change that. So that gives us, thank you for highlighting that issue, Dr. Yanisi, that gives us an idea. <laughs> um, and I think he even said, Dr. Yanisi, if I'm correct, you want them to write with short sentences. Why? Short sentences are more clear. They're easier to follow. Um, and it kind of goes to the same point of omitting surplus words, avoiding legalese. It doesn't mean our points are simple. It means we're explaining our points with direct, concrete, easy to understand language. Our language does not have to be complicated to convey a complicated point. Um, so short sentences are especially useful, not only for ease of reading, we can avoid mistakes. It's very, the longer our sentences are, even for experienced writers, it's very easy to make a mistake. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands. Who is familiar with the concept um, or has learned before about topic sentences? Not sure if this is a phrase that uh, is more uh, predominant in the US context when it comes to not just legal writing, but all writing. We use this term a lot. 
and I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, maybe you might call it something else in the Indian context and in the Turkish context, um, but all a topic sentence is, is the first sentence of a paragraph. So something that can be very effective for legal writing is to pay attention to your topic sentences. And we'll talk about this tomorrow in persuasive, persuasive writing. Oftentimes you wanna start with your conclusion, right? And, um, and, that, and then you want to prove your conclusion and detail your conclusion um, that starts with your first topic sentence, right? Instead of just starting with an introductory sentence and getting to the main point. So in other words, you're starting with the main point in the first uh, sentence of each paragraph. So sometimes for a proofreading exercise, I have my students write down the topic sentence of each paragraph in their memo or their complaint, right? We do a lot of work with legal memos. That should be an outline. So do you remember when we started talking in the beginning about how to start writing? Um, we had several comments on creating an outline. Well, an outline can be plugged into your topic sentence. That also, what is a topic sentence? It signals the reader. It signals the busy reader. It's like a road sign and it tells the busy reader, I'm going to talk about the murder now. Now I'm going to talk about the murder scene. Now I'm gonna talk about the defendant's alibi, right? Um, and, and the same is true when we use topic sentences for um, uh, uh, law, right? I'm going to talk about the rule now I'm going to talk about how the court has interpreted the rule. Now I'm gonna talk about how the court, how I want this court to apply the rule. So um, you don't have to do everything in a topic sentence, but you can alert your reader to what you're gonna be doing in your paragraph. And I believe Dr. Yenesi uh, also talked about short paragraphs. Um, and so uh, I mentioned that here too, right? Sentences are short and paragraphs are short. Um, one thing I want to talk about is that specifically the sentences that you use to convey. Um, I use here a court's holding. Um, if this is less relevant in Turkish law, then perhaps you would use a sentence. Uh, I'm not sure if you would quote a statute or use a sentence to convey a statute. Um, but when talking about the judgment or holding, right, decision of a court, um, think about the same thing that we think about with active voice, right? Um, we want to say the most, and the same thing I talked about yesterday with um, knowing the legally relevant facts and what issue or what element is at issue. So if we think about how to introduce a court holding, we can start with the actor, the court held, we, and then we can include the legal rule I used the First Amendment, we could use criminal prostitution statute, and then the factual consequence. So in our prostitution example, this is an example from um, American law under the First Amendment, but in our prostitution example that we've been working with, the court held under the criminal solicitation statute that uh, soliciting um, customers from a balcony uh, qualified as soliciting from the street and therefore violated the statute. So you can accomplish a lot in, a, in the first sentence of a court holding um, that also gives the reader the most important points about the court holding. Um, now we're going to kind of switch topics to document design. Um, and this is might be a little bit jurisdiction specific um, so one thing that we work a lot on in US writing, especially in court submissions, is um, how the document looks and how the paragraphs are arranged. And so we work a lot on avoiding, uh, thank you, Dr. Genesee, uh, avoiding these kinds of um, looks, which are, we call orphan widows, orphans and widows. Yes, Dr. Genesee, I'd like to hear what you have to say. You mentioned uh, Nazi swastika. It is forbidden in Germany to wear that or to mention that. So there's a big difference in the- Oh, I'm, I see. This I just want, want to mention. Thank you. 
Yes, um, it's discussed a lot in um, in American law because uh, it comes up with the First Amendment questions. So thank you. I can choose a more culturally appropriate <laughs> um, example. Um, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, so when you think about document design, um, we think about um, just making it easy to read and making it pleasant to look at. And so even if the norms are different, you wanna think about it. Um, I'm going to ask just for some participation, which design of this email do you like better and why? Uh, thank you, Gulendam. Go ahead. Well, the one uh, on the right side of the screen seems way better than the other one uh, not only because the like the font they've used is a bit formal but there are spaces in, in between the like there are paragraphs and it makes to separate the topics to like from one another and it makes it easier to read easier to understand and easier to focus on what's important like the greetings and like the other kind of things are divided somewhere, but the main thing that we need to focus is on the middle and it's separated. It's more attractive. I Thank think you. the one on the right is on the way better. Thank you. Uh, Sevgi, do you agree or disagree? I agree. I was going to uh, say the same thing because, because it's so easy to analyze it. Yeah, so we see, thank you very much. I agree completely, Gulendan and Sevgi. And this was to show you that the idea of a document design, um, taking a little time to design our document can really facilitate the um, ease with which we read something. Um, so we wanna pay attention to that. Um, something we talk a lot about is quotes, um, but I wanna make sure we get to um, the uh, exercise that we have with Dr. Yadav. Um, so I will just say that in the American context, if you have a lot of text to quote, um, it's often better to preview the meaning of the quote for the court or the opposing counsel or, your, or even your client. Um, and actually many courts have rules, no block quotes. So if it's more than two lines, a court in the US will say, that's a block quote, please don't use that. Um, so let's, um, okay, so one thing that I've seen students struggle with is how to write an appropriate email. Um, and um, something that um, was suggested to me by my son when he learned how to be, uh, learn how to coach sailing, right? Um, he was told to always use a compliment sandwich. Start with something positive, have anything difficult in the middle, end with something positive. Um, and so if you're struggling with an email, that's often a good way to approach it. Always start with something positive. Um, that has, and, and also for me, it helps my mindset in terms, of, in terms of staying positive. So when we talk about tone, we are talking about the, um, the attitude and mood or emotion of your writing. Um, and so let's, um, one last problem, one or two last problems before we switch to our next, um, our, our breakout rooms. Um, tell me what the difference in the tone is between the red and the green. So the red opposing counsel endlessly repeats the allegations, or perhaps the in talking about the other party, the plaintiff's incredible allegations versus in the green, opposing counsel states in five paragraphs, the affirmative defense of, or the plaintiff alleges both that he saw X, Y, Z, and didn't see A, B, C, the broken scaffolding. Do you see, is there a difference in the mood or tone of that? 
Aslahan, thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, it is factual and it is giving uh, the facts, uh, talking about the facts and the details, uh, not complicated details, uh, but which will ease the reader uh, to understand uh, what uh, is the base of the allegation. So it's always better to talk with facts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Aslahan. Yes, and even though you might uh, not be getting along with your opposing counsel, um, it's better to be polite and factual rather than to use insults um, or uh, characterize either your opposing counsel or the party. I saw a hand up from Subankar. Would you like to? Yes, ma'am. In the first uh, uh, red, red uh, it was harsh, and in the second, it was polite. Yes, thank you. So um, that I guess that this is working cross culturally, harsh versus polite. And Aslahan had a very important point: factual. So the green is factual, and if you're factual, you can't really lose. So the last two points are thinking about your organization, short paragraphs. I always tell my students no more than half a page. Um, use topic sentences make it easy for the busy reader. And just like Aslahan mentioned, be specific and factual. Um, oh, I'm sorry, is there? Oh, thank you, Dr. Yenisey, yes? So before you go to breakout rooms, I want to show you a checklist we have produced. Oh. And here are the questions to the judge. Did you repeat yourself? Did you make the sentences short? <laughs> reasoning, et cetera. There are the questions and the judge should make, give himself a note. Here you see from one to six, five, and just controls himself. If he did comply with the uh, short sentences and giving reasoning, et cetera. Well, great minds think alike, we would say in the US. <laughs> and are the judges complying with this list, this checklist? Uh, this has not been published yet. This is I just progress in progress. I see. I see. I wish and maybe we need a, a list like that for American judges as well. <laughs> um, so, um, so thank you for illustrating how important that is to the local bar, bar and the practicing bar um, that you, we write in a clear matter and that judges write in a clear matter. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, We've talked about topic sentences and we've talked about um, emails. <laughs> emails, yes. So I'd like to um, turn it over for another um, exercise with um, Professor Barty. Let's see, looks like we lost our screen. While we're waiting for our internet connection to get back up. Yeah, uh, so uh, we wanted to share something with you by the time our technician come to uh, deal with the issue, technical issue, which we always struggle with. Uh, I would like to add on another component after the brilliant presentation, the discussion uh, by my colleague, Professor Margaret, and I'm sure uh, these are the pointers and do's and don'ts you will definitely keep in your mind uh, while uh, writing uh, any piece of writing which you think of, be it for your academic writing or for practicing law. Because these uh, themes I was uh, observing very uh, uh, closely that it's not just limited to your writing of the briefs, uh, which are useful for practicing law, but otherwise also when you write your emails, when you uh, address your clients uh, through written uh, emails or otherwise when as an advocate you wish to publish, because that also adds to your recognition, publicity, and acknowledgement of the good work which you are doing. So those skills can be used for multiple purposes. Uh, with this, I would like to take you to a new component that is the content of the writing, components of the writing. Yesterday we studied about uh, ways 
of doing effective legal research, because first of all, you need to ensure uh, that you have the adequate and uh, uh, legal material. You can substantiate your ideas, opinion, argument with law uh, statute so that your uh, expression doesn't remain as an uh, opinion, but it comes out uh, with a strong argument uh, with the supporting and backing from the existing laws. Uh, next stage, the step comes that, okay, you have done the research and now you want to write it express, uh, expressively that we studied and discussed so far. And now the third component comes in, which is what should be the basic components of your writing when it comes to writing, uh, academic writing or other forms of writing. And uh, generally you might have noticed that when, you, when your professor gives you certain readings to read, sometimes you struggle uh, with the crux or essence of the reading. Sometimes you feel that, yeah, the writing has been written so impressively, but I am failing to find the message that what exactly is the outcome of this reading. And to avoid that in your readings and getting the same response from your readers, you need to ensure a few things in your writing. That is first, always introduce, always introduce your writings. Second component is always introduce the problem or issue which you wish to address to. It should, be, it should come at the very beginning of your writings. It should not be that, okay, half the way uh, gone and now people are finding uh, that, okay, this is the concern, this is the issue you, uh, you want to address and all this is a background. So your writing should always be proportionate. But at the very beginning, you introduce the topic, then uh, you uh, must deal with, explain what exactly is the problem or issue you wish to do with. Uh, our technician has come, so I'll take a pause here.
Hmm. Uh, apologies for interruption. So there was some network issue and uh, we just fixed it. Our technician helped us. He's so kind to us that he always come within, within a few seconds when we call him. Uh, so we were talking about the components that your message should not only be effectively written, but it should be clear that what exactly is the message you wish to convey. So your expression is one thing, but the content is another thing. So we need to focus on expression of our writing, but at the same time, we need to ensure that our message, our issue which we are dealing with and what outcome we suggest is very clear. So there are a few components which I would like to show you by sharing the screen. I'll, I'll show you one sample. And then in the breakout rooms, I will be giving you similar exercise and you all will have to do it and showcase your work. And after that, I'll show you the sample answer for that. Uh, so I hope my screen is visible to you. It is. Yeah. So it relates to the same reading which I discussed with you yesterday about the reasoning, uh, method of reasoning, and how judiciary uh, adjudicate and what kind of reasoning do they adopt in majority of the cases generally when there is an established principle of law and how uh, the parliament, the legislature, uh, enacts the law. So keeping that in mind, the discussion we uh, had in the yesterday class, we, I did, uh, drafted the sample uh, writing for you. So always keep certain things in your mind that is your title should be self-speaking. The very title should give an insight to the aspects we are gonna deal with it. So its title is ensuring justice through the interplay of legal reasoning and insight to the reasoning of judiciary and legislature in India. So we will go through it and you will, you will be telling me, first thing, you need to tell me two things. One is what all uh, the inputs you have learned so far, you need to read this text on the screen and you need to tell me how it can further be improved. Like Professor Yane said, small sentences. Uh, Professor Margaret talked about punctuation and one word substitute of uh, multiple words. So you will read uh, this text and you will be telling me uh, those uh, those inputs uh, for effective expression. In addition to that, I wish to highlight the three components which I was referring to. That is, first of all, introduce the topic. Second is, refer to the problem you wish to address. And third is, what are the questions which you are going to deal with? If at the very beginning of your writing, you set these three components clear, then it becomes clear and easier for you also to proceed and also very systematic for the readers to understand step by step that what do you wish to convey. Otherwise, sometimes you must have also experienced that you yourself get confused that, yeah, I had some idea, but uh, I did research and now I don't know where I'm going. So you should need, you need to have a design, a plan for writing your title, which is self-speaking, then you introduce the topic, then you introduce the problem. Introduction is different from the core problem issue which you're going to discuss. And then to further refine it, to, to specifically highlight the areas of the problem which you wish to research on. So then you, you, you draft your questions. So in the, uh, in, uh, on your screen, you see, these three components in the different color. In the yellow is the introduction. The blue one is the uh, problem, which this writing uh, can refer to. And the green one are the questions. So my uh, suggestion or uh, request to you is that could you please suggest me the changes or uh, your suggestions in the first pahera, which relates to uh, introduction, or do you think that it actually introduced the title which you see on the screen? So you can, you can relate it to the discussion which we had yesterday. 
So with that background understanding, it, it, it will be easier for you uh, to analyze the given text on the screen. Should we increase the font of this or is it easily visible? So this is a sample of the exercise which, which we will be giving you for the breakout rooms. So for your breakout room, I will be giving you one title and on that, you will have to write these three component of, of the, on the title. Your introduction, what exactly could be a problem which you wish to research on the title, and then what could be the questions. Your expression should be guided by the discussion which Professor Margaret have had so far. Your writing needs to have these three components. Your title, which is self-speaking, then you introduce to reflect your title, the problem which it has, and the questions. But first of all, let's do some exercise over the uh, draft which you see over your screen. So when you read the first para, do you think that something can be improved in the light of uh, discussion which you, you had so far? Like, do you think that any sentence is too long? It can be broken into smaller sentences or a couple of words can be replaced by one word kind of thing. I'm increasing the point. I just think that you could just take it. I think we can read it. You, like, I can see it easily, so there is no need to like make it bigger. So if, if you make it bigger, it won't fit in one page. So I think for me, it's okay. I don't want to talk for everyone, but- Just to control A. Size is okay. Control A. Maybe you can, if, I don't know if it's possible, but if you make the page style landscape, not portrait, it will fit more text in the screen. It's okay. Uh, no worries, now it's everything is on the screen, fine. So any suggestion for the first para which introduces the topic? Maybe we can make the first sentence active instead of passive. That would make it shorter, but it's okay this way as well. But if we must make a change, we can start with that maybe. Okay. Uh, so one thing which I wanted to exhibit is in your writing, you need to have certain basic components so that the reader are not confused about the issue which you want to deal with and issue needs an introduction so that they understand the context. So from the introduction comes the context, then you come narrow it down to the issue which you want to research it. And then the further questions make it more specific. So for the breakout room, the exercise is, the exercise is, Uh, the exercise is that uh, how online teaching 
can promote or can offer clinical courses. So I hope uh, uh, in all of your law school, you have practical courses for legal aid, access to justice, uh, which are which are which are uh, practical oriented courses. So the th I'm just giving you theme uh, subject. I'm like vague idea of the subject you wish to write on. Write a title for it. Write an introduction. Write a problem. What exactly is the problem with that? And the research questions. So the subject matter which you need to think on is online teaching i'm i'm telling you uh, the 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 key words for it online teaching clinical course slash legal aid slash practical course effective teaching and fourth key word is uh, during covid and after so these are the four keywords right we generally do our search through the keywords. We discussed it yesterday and today also somewhere. So these are the keywords. And now you need to go the reverse flow. Generally, we have the title, we have the article, we have the writing, and then we have the keywords. So uh, today I have just given you the keywords. With these four keywords, write down an abstract kind of thing where it has a title, it has an introduction, then what exactly is the problem? And then what could be the specific questions which can be researched on? So now we are breaking you all in the breakout rooms and uh, you will get 10 minutes to discuss. And then after that, each group can present. More than one student of a group can also present or one person can be nominated by the group to present. And we'll be visiting all the groups to facilitate. And after your presentation, I will be showing you a sample answer for this class exercise also, that how can it be done? And you need to keep in your mind both things, expression of writing and also the components of writing. Go ahead.
let's go close it and let me share uh, this thing problem. I need to open it up still. Can can Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. I'm just leaving now. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Aslahan. It was great to have your participation. I really appreciated your content. <laughs> Thank you for, for having me. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye. Take care.
Uh, so as everybody is back, we would like to have a quick, quick round of reporting from each of the groups. And we will conclude the session uh, with the sample fourth exercise, which we just gave you for the group exercise. So who wish to come from group two? Okay, Vishal, yes. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the topic uh, which we decided, it can be shift in pedagogy of clinical legal education before and after COVID. Mm -hmm. That's the time frame. And the introduction part could be uh, the first part of the introduction. It could be focusing on how this online pedagogy bridges the boundaries of everything, be it someone's economic perspective, someone's geographical perspective. But in the same abstract part, the last part can be can contain a problem. And the problem can be... Uh, the virtual platforms do not have sufficient tools for the stimulation. And by stimulation, I mean uh, the tools which make virtual platforms at par with the real uh, physical platforms. And the research problem can be, till what extent this online platforms, this virtual platforms are inclusive when it comes to the perspective of clinical legal education? Okay, and we, uh, okay. Uh, group one would like to, good, good attempt, Vishal. Thank you, ma'am. Group one. Yeah, hello, ma'am. Uh, our title uh, is Online Clinical uh, Teaching Effectiveness During and After COVID. Uh, uh, with respect to the introduction, online clinical uh, teaching uh, is, a is a paradigm shift in learning all thanks to COVID. Uh, it has opened up many innovative paths, like uh, uh, today the telephonic advisory, that's like we have mentioned it as an example. Uh, then it has helped reaching uh, more people. Uh, uh, also, there is always a probability of another pandemic in future. So in that case, uh, it, it becomes really essential. Uh, with respect to the problems, uh, uh, we have mentioned it that uh, the number one problem is regarding the quality of legal aid. Uh, second, uh, can it uh, 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 can it can we bring it close uh, to the interaction with the client in a physical setup? Uh, second is the third is effectiveness of teaching and learning. Uh, then. Fourth are the technological and technical challenges which we would face. Uh, uh, fifth is the supervision and regulatory control over legal aid clinics. Uh, then uh, the questions are, uh, uh, can we br bridge uh, the technological uh, uh, know-how? Uh, then uh, the second question is, is it effective in learning? Uh, and uh, do we have, uh, the third question is, do we have guidelines to monitor the clinic? Yeah, very good attempt, very good. Yeah. We'll be sh uh, sharing the sample answers and then you'll get some more ideas. Uh, uh, and this is for all the groups, not just to the immediate presenter. Good attempt. Yes, thank you, ma'am. And uh, which group is left now? Third or first? Uh, third. Third, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So Stenzin or Asim, do you want to go or should I go? Uh, I think it'd be better if you do that. Okay. Then our title is How Did Online Learning Affect Our Approach to Clinical Courses? Uh, in our introduction, we talked about the technology and the online courses. Uh, I read what we wrote. Technology, technology has advanced enormously in the last century and now it's available almost every part of the world. Online learning also improved during the last years with technology. With COVID, online learning became a necessity more than a choice. And clinical courses are a question to be raised when it comes to online learning. There are many points of views and approaches regarding the clinical courses via online learning. And we have three questions regarding that topic. Uh, is online learning as effective as physical learning for all of the studies? like law, like pharmacy, etc. cetera. Uh, the second question is, does everyone has the same opportunity and accessibility to the online learning? 
And the third question is, did COVID affect the emergence of the online learning systems or it, did it make it faster? Very good, very good. Uh, uh, Gulinde, I really like your introduction because you introduce technology, education, and like online uh, clinical, clinical courses, and then you came up the challenges which could be posed and then specific questions. Now I would like to uh, share a simple answer, which is just a simple, okay? So it may have something which I missed out by, while drafting uh, the draft for you. So the tentative or a draft title could be redefining le clinical legal education in the light of technological advancement during and after COVID-19. So when I'm showing the sample, that does not mean this can only be the title. This could be one of the title. I'm just exhibiting it because see, it has all the components to it. It's about redefining, which signifies that, okay, the technology is kind of redefining, and revisiting, bringing some change. That's why I was saying your title should be self-speaking of the content which you would be addressing in the writing redefining clinical legal education in the light of technological advancements during and after the COVID-19. So it has everything which is needed uh, for uh, just adding the expression to the content below it. Then comes the introduction, the teaching. So your yellow part is the introduction, blue part is the problem, and green is the equation which will come to, and we, we are going component wise. So first component is the introduction. Teaching is considered a noble profession as it contributes to people's empowerment by disseminating knowledge and making them skilled, which ultimately build a strong foundation for a nation to grow. Teaching is an art that requires different skills to meet the requirements of learner from different socioeconomic background. So it gives a kind of context, background understanding. Okay, what does teaching do? And what does it require to have to serve the purpose for which it is being imparted? And then the blue part relates to the problem, problem which was brought in by COVID-19. So it starts like this, like all other professions, teaching is also adversely affected by COVID-19 induced restriction. Virtual education somehow managed to continue the dissemination of knowledge, but its efficiency in practical courses like clinical courses need reassessment. The new norms have restricted personal interactions, which are essential feature of pre-COVID pedagogy. Now disseminating knowledge and making students skilled without in-person contact pose a big challenge for accreditation. So that's the problem which was introduced by COVID-19, though we still try to proceed further. So now comes the next component, and that is what could be the questions which you wish to, because the problem which I just uh, showcased you on the screen, it could have multiple perspective aspects to it, but it's not possible to cover all. So that's why through the research question, you can narrow it down to the areas you which you wish to address it. So if somebody asks, you didn't cover that aspect? Yes. At the very beginning, you clarify that these are the aspects you will be covering regarding this problem, which you have identified. So some of the questions could be, how can law clinics help people realize their legal right without compromising safety measures during pandemic. Major, major research question. Because students can't be exposed to the risk. They can't be uh, asked to break the norms. Second, can law students learn the practicality of law and keep their sense of social responsibility intact through law clinics abiding by social distancing norm? So, okay. And see, your uh, question should be in a chronological or some sequencing order. It should be in sequence. That, okay, when we say, okay, we cannot ask students to break the norms. If we're not asking them, can they learn the practicality of the law? Second question. Then third question. Can intervening uh, intervention of technology manage the barriers of social distance to make the law clinic functional in the true sense? Then we say, okay, uh, through the intervention of technology, something can still be kept alive, kept moving, kept functional. But the thing is, 
will it be that effective and this question the third question should not be your first question at all because the question of technology comes when you have ruled out other options fourth question suppose we presume the technology can handle the field work for law clinics by contacting people virtually so the answer which you give for the third question that okay if not in person virtually still technology can assist the students and the supervising faculty to contact people next question okay even if they are virtually uh, assisting the contact with the people in need of legal aid then are we not ignoring embedded inequality of society because it's not just an institution having the infrastructure uh, which uh, which is supported by technology it's also about people who need legal aid and it's not possible that everybody has a, a, a laptop computer or mobile phone next uh, should technology skill be a prerequisite for experiential teaching and learning through virtual law clinics next question that it's not about only the people who need legal aid it's also about the teachers are they uh, skilled trained in the use of technology next question can virtual law clinics sustain their need and relevance beyond pandemic and then comes the next question okay through the technological assistance uh, somehow we managed to survive during pandemic but does it hold some relevance even after the pandemic because so much of uh, time and effort were invested on learning the new skills by the teacher by the students and also um, making people acquainted about this uh, online mode of realizing their rights does it has any relevance post pandemic and see this question has reflection in the title itself and last question can the learning of student be assessed how can the learning of student be assessed in online teaching rather than just focusing on the evaluation of their knowledge through entrance examination because there the term in the title is effective teaching revisiting so these question can has the reflection of the title which we thought of so our point is if you move ahead systematically at the beginning of your writing if you frame a structure like this then it will become very easy for you to proceed further it will save time it will give you more effective mode of presentation at the same time when the readers will read your uh, writing they will understand that okay what is the context what exactly is issue or problem you are addressing and on that problem or issue what are the dimensions which you are covering with and in this sample you see that how comprehensive it is title has each and every component which you wrote under the title all the questions can be found in the title itself the sequencing of questions so it is helpful for both uh, the the right for both writers as well as the readers and while writing the components content to it ensure that you follow the skills do's and don'ts the the strategies which professor margaret taught you in today's class because both are equally important your component of the writing and the expression of content of those component and collectively it make, makes an effective writing which has the potential of serving the purpose for which it has been written uh with this i would like to request professor margaret uh to give the concluding remark for the session i'd just like to um thank professor barty for that wonderful exercise that allowed us to use the breakout rooms and that illustrated so many of the concepts that we worked with today and also yesterday and I'd like to thank all of you for participating and for applying your effort. Um, I hope that you can take away some tips for uh, legal writing. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our final session on uh, persuasion, uh, where we will incorporate some of the lessons and build on some of the lessons we've learned over the week um, with some more examples and discussion-based learning. So thank you so much for coming and thank you for participating and your effort. Um, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And we'll be sharing these two samples for your reference as a reading material. Thank you. Thank you.